When we arrived in Australia for the first time in November 1980, it quickly became clear that things were going to be crazy. We'd been told KISS was massive there, but you never know what to expect. You can only comprehend things you've already experienced. Australia was like nothing we'd ever experienced. Huge here meant not being able to leave the hotel. It meant taking a helicopter from the hotel to the stadium we were playing. The phenomenon we witnessed became known there as Kisteria. We had an entire floor of the hotel with one suite devoted to our own Australian public relations staff. And no wonder, since we were on the front page of the newspapers every day accompanied by headlines like Kiss and Midnight Cruise on Sydney Harbor, we had to keep the curtains drawn in our rooms. The place was crawling with bodyguards and there was a constant drone of screaming outside. You're not going anywhere, we were told. Thankfully, Australia had its own penthouse magazine and a number of penthouse pets came over to the hotel to keep us company. Paparazzi camped in front of the hotel, and whenever we went anywhere, we had to hide on the floors of vans. Every single night, the promoters threw parties which were packed with models and actresses. Some parties were women only. We would show up at a club or ballroom that had been taken over, and the place would be filled with beautiful women. Australia was one giant chicken coop. Eric, however, would often leave the parties and go out and befriend some waif he met on the street. He identified with the fans. Maybe he felt more like them than like one of us at that point. He sometimes brought girls to his room who had been camping outside trying to catch a glimpse of the band. For his comfort, he chose women like that over models and penthouse pets. Issues shape personalities. The first hints of Eric's trouble started to come out, too. One day, he rented a car and driver to spend a day in the countryside with a girl he'd met. He was so nervous, he told us, that he got awful gas and had to stop the car every ten minutes to go to the bathroom. He was depressed afterwards about what an idiot he felt like. He also went on about how he was losing his hair. His hair was so big that when he moved forward, it moved backwards. It was always moving in the opposite direction from the rest of him. And yet he constantly wanted me to look at his head. Look, is it thinning here? And strangest of all, Eric struggled with the idea that he wasn't the original drummer of the band. I didn't understand it. I mean, of course he wasn't the original drummer. He was the second drummer. So what? There was no talking him out of his funk when he started obsessing over the fact that he would never be the first drummer. In Australia, I began to seriously question Bill O'Coin. His cocaine use had become more extreme, and since splitting up with Sean Delaney, his general behavior had become reckless, too. One morning, I went to his room and found a boy in his early teens eating a bowl of cereal in Bill's bed. Another morning, I found a different boy there. Bill was out of control. When we got back to the States, a boy who had won a contest had been flown in to meet us, along with a photographer from the magazine that had sponsored the contest. Bill was clearly hitting on the kid. The next day, I said, Bill, tell me you didn't. Yes, I did. And the photographer. Bill had crossed a line into an area I saw as criminal and immoral. I was no longer laughing.